Okay. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you, and we give you the honor and the glory and the praise for it, Lord. We give you thanksgiving for everything you've done and everything you plan on doing. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say it, amen. amen. Come on and give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Well, turn around and greet two or three of your neighbors, and you may be seated. We'll get into this tonight. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30. I, uh, this weekend, I'm going to be, be teaching on a very significant series of sermons on how to be delivered from shame by grace. And um, I wanted to have an opportunity to talk to you about restoration because that's, that's really a big thing. It's... Uh, People go through things, and they, 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 they sometimes forget that whatever may happen in the negative can be restored. And you, you need to be reminded that for a Christian, it's not over. No, whatever, whatever condition you may find yourself, whatever position you may find yourself in, it, it's not over. You know, one of the most powerful things you can do is what you guys are doing right now, sitting and hearing the Word. Amen. Not very dramatic. It's not something that uh, is even very spectacular. But it is extremely supernatural sitting and hearing the Word. And so, I want to encourage you tonight to understand that whatever the circumstance is, whatever the situation is, whatever it was, it can be restored because you serve a God that restores. Amen? Now, we've been talking about rest, and I want to show you this acronym as I move into this different phase here, and, and I want you to see what this word rest I'm using as an acronym tonight. It's the restoration of what? Of everything Satan took. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, the restoration of everything Satan took. But here's the thing that ministered to me. If God is going to restore, you got to be at rest. If God is going to restore the things that have been stolen, the things that have been taken, you got to be at rest. Everything that Satan took from you, ladies and gentlemen, it can be restored. Amen. Glory, that's good news to me. That's good news to me which means you don't have to mope around or be sad or be defeated. Shame is a weight that stops you from moving ahead into your future. And I'm saying to you, you don't have to ever be shamed because of restoration. So I want to encourage you with this word tonight before, we, before this weekend gets here. And go with me again to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17. <clears throat> Jeremiah 30, 17. I want you to say this out loud, just one word, restore. restore. I want you to get used to saying that because you need to start saying it. Sickness hits your body, the first word I want coming out of your mouth is restore. Something unfortunate happened financially and, and, and unexpected stuff showed up, so restore. That's what you have available to you. You rest and you watch God restore. 
Amen. Yeah. Satan may think he's defeating you. He can't Amen. because of who you are and whose you are. Amen. Yeah. And look what he says in verse, verse 17, Jeremiah 30. For I will restore. Now, first of all, I want you to know that restoration is God's will. It's God's will to restore. Say that out loud. It's God's will to restore. So whatever's happening or has happened in your life, it's God's will to restore. And notice what he says, for I will restore health unto thee. So if sickness is on your body, it's God's will to restore. It's God's will. For you to settle for sickness when God's will is for you to restore, the only way that you don't get the restoration is you're not believing for it. David said, I had to believe that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So goodness didn't just show up. He had to believe for it. You got to believe for restoration. You have to believe that God, his will is to restore. He wants to restore. Now, how many of you need, how many of you have something in your life that, that has been stolen, that's missing, or has been taken from you? Somebody say, restore. Restore. All right. He says, for I will restore health unto thee. Praise God. Man, I'm a living witness. God has restored health unto me. Praise God. But, I, but here's the thing that, 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 that just really ministers to me. He wants to. How many of you know God is for you? Amen. But how many of you know God's, God has been for you since you've been here? Since you've been alive, God's been for you. God's not just for you because you start acting right. right. He's been for you. Amen. 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 I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Now, here's what got me. Why will you restore all this to me, Lord? He said, because they called thee an outcast, saying, this is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Here's what the Lord ministered to me. He says, I'm going to restore some things unto you because of what somebody else did to you. He says, I'm going to restore some things unto you because of what somebody else said about you. He said, I'm restoring them because they called you an outcast. Oh, I don't know what they called you. Now, they called me a little worse than an outcast. I don't know what they called you, but it's God's will to restore whatever somebody called you. I, I, I tell you what, I see a God of restoration, a God that wants to, a God that wills to, if we will release our faith to believe it. I will restore your health. I'm going to heal your wounds. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. God said, Oh, it is my will to restore. And I'm just so thankful. You always need to know that God is, is on your side. God is for you. They, they ask the question in Romans, you know, uh, if God is for you. No, God is for you. Say out loud, God is for me. God is for me. Amen. He is for you. And he wants to restore you. Now, look at Joel, the prophet Joel, chapter 2, the book of Joel, chapter 2. And let's look at, uh, I want to start at verse 21, and I'm going to read down to verse 26. Verse 21, he says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Now, I want you to notice tonight the amount of times you see God saying rejoice and be glad. <clears throat> rejoice and be glad. And I'm talking about rejoicing and being glad when, when nothing's going right. Yes. That's a part of, of supernatural restoration. If you want to know what do I need to be doing before I see restoration, rejoice and be glad. He said, fear not, old land, be glad. Verse 21 again. Fear not, old land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. I have to prophesy that over your life. God will do great things. I got to say that over you right now. God will do great things in your life. How many of you believe that? God will do great things. Say out loud, God will do great things. 22. He says, be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring 
For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the, and the vine do yield their strength. 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the same, or in the first month. Now, that, that, that's a Hebrew phrase when he says first month. It, it means all at the same time. The, the latter rain and the former rain, rain referring to anointing, uh, God's ability painted and put on you. He says, we have walked in the former anointing moderately, but he's going to cause us to walk in the former anointing, the anointing that was on Elijah, the anointing that was on Moses and them. That's that former rain, okay? And we've walked in that moderately. But he's going to cause to come down for you the former and the latter rain at the same time. Now, this is prophetic, and this is something that we are about to see. Amen. We're about to see the former anointing and the latter anointing coming on the planet at the same time on you. Amen. So what is this anointing going to do? Verse, verse uh, 24. Now watch this. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. Anytime there's a strong anointing in the earth, overflow is the characteristic of a strong anointing. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, you can't get mixed up because when you look in Look at, look, when you look in Egypt, it's going to seem like there's lack. But when you look back at Goshen, there's going to be an overflow. The overflow is going to be located where the rain is. Uh, and that's what's going to attract the world because they're going to see that overflow. Verse 25. And I will what? Restore to you the years. How many of y'all got some years that need to be restored? Ah, my God. You thought God forgot about those years. You thought God forgot about those years when things were to taken from you. you. You thought God forgot about those years where things were lost. You thought God forgot about those years when they called you something. I don't know what they called you. But God hadn't forgotten about anything that we've gone through. And the promise is before this is all over with, he will restore the years. Now here, as this was recorded in the Old Testament, it says, I'll restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent amongst you. He says, I'm going to restore. Look at verse 26. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. You're going to praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. My people shall never be ashamed. See, that's the number one thing Satan's tried to do with the, with the church, the body of Christ, is shame you. And here's the unfortunate thing, is that most of the shame, most of the shame that people get, they get it at church and from church people, shaming you for what you couldn't do right. But God says, I'm about to release an anointing. Now, I don't know where you think the anointing is going to be released. It's not going to just be released on the, on the ground. It's going to be released on you. Child of God, y'all better get ready. This thing is getting ready to accelerate. I, I told you what used to take a year is only going to take a matter of months, and what used to take a matter of months is only going to take a matter of weeks. What used to take a matter of weeks is going to take a matter of days. What used to take days is going to take hours. Because when that anointing shows up, there's going to be an acceleration. There's going to be a release of plenty. We are about to enter into one of the greatest revivals that this earth has ever seen, and they don't even know it's coming. God says, when I finish, my people will never be ashamed. So get ready. The shame is about to be removed. 
I'm convinced that God put this series of sermons on my heart because it's time. I said, it's time. There's a set time the Bible talks about. There's an appointed time. I'll show you tonight how even in, in just, just the timing of everything, there's a time for this. And I feel so strongly led to minister these things into your heart tonight as we prepare to go. And I, I think it's going to be one of the most revelatory series I've ever done before in my life. And it, um, it, it ministered to me. It broke me. It, it did all kinds of things to me emotionally because the whole time God was on it. And I thought shame was an issue that was more for the psychiatrist. But Jesus had already fixed the thing. Why the psychiatrist still trying to figure it out? Oh, don't get me started here. All right? Now, let's look at this. Look at Psalms 51, verse 12. I just want to show you restoration is in the Bible. It is something that you as a Christian should expect. You should never be, you should never be hopeless. You should always be hopeful because of the God you have. Verse 12 says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now, here's the thing I want you to hear about this. I don't know if you can recall when you were born again and just the joy of knowing that Jesus rescued you from a burning hell, just the joy of knowing that you were, are, were the accepted into his beloved and over the years, things may happen. You may be disappointed because of how other people have treated you. You may be disappointed because of some of the things you saw. You may be disappointed because some of the things you expected and it didn't come along with your expectation. But I tell you, God is gonna, God is gonna restore the joy that came with your salvation. Amen. You're gonna be glad to be saved again. Amen. You're gonna be so full of joy that you're born again and and Jesus is your Lord, and you're going to find yourself witnessing the people that you thought you'd never witness to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because God is restoring the joy of your salvation. I want you to say that out loud. God's restoring my joy. God's restoring my joy. Now, notice in each of these scriptures, we've not been able to get away from joy and gladness. Joy, gladness, restoration. Joy, gladness, restoration. Restore your joy, and other things will be restored. There's something about, well, the Bible tells us the joy of the Lord is our strength. And joy is so, it's like dynamite. When it's lit, it becomes explosive. It, it accomplishes things. And as Christians, we got, to, we got to locate our joy. You can't let your joy be dampered out by the things that are happening in the world. You've got to locate your joy. Let me show you something here. In Habakkuk, 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 <laughs> chapter 3, verse 17, I want you to see an illustration of what I'm talking about, joy. Joy, joy comes from what you know. Happiness comes from your comfort. So there's a slight difference between joy and happiness. Happiness comes because you're comfortable. Joy comes because you're knowledgeable. There's, there's things you know. So when something crazy happens, you can have joy because you know you have a God of restoration. All right, look at verse 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail. The fields shall yield no meat, dear God. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Now, check this guy out. Ain't nothing working. There's nothing working. There is, there is no physical reason why he ought to have any joy. All right? But look what the recommendation is. Verse 18. Yet, somebody say, yet. Yes. See, there's, there's, 
the, 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 the things aren't working around him, yet I will rejoice. That's a decision. That says when nothing's working, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And look what happens, verse 19. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singers on the stringed instruments. Now listen to what I'm saying here. There's something about taking what you know and using it to, to, to increase your joy when there's no reason to be joyful. Things are not working, but you will rejoice. If you're going to rejoice, make sure you definitely do it when things aren't working. Amen. Make sure you do it when there's no reason to do it. Don't have joy when there's just a reason to have joy. Have joy when there's no reason to have joy. Joy becomes your strength to cause things to happen when things aren't working. If the joy of the Lord can be maintained in the life of a Christian, that joy will, will have a lot to do with restoration. Now, again, these are principles of working your faith to receive what Jesus has already done. These are principles of things that you're doing. Somebody says, well, that ain't grace. Yes, it is, girl. It is grace. It's, grace has made everything available. Your issue is, is you can't get none of it. So you need to learn how to look at your life, evaluate what you're doing and what, what you're not doing so that you can enter into the rest. Remember, the place of rest is the place where it manifests. What's going what's to happen when nothing's working and I decide to rejoice? Rejoicing helps me to get into that place of rest. Rejoicing helps me to stay out of worry. Rejoicing helps me to, to stay out of the stress of it all. I will rejoice. I will have joy. And as you are in that place of rest, then the, by God's grace, he will begin to start restoring things into your life. I'm telling you that if you choose to not to have joy when things aren't working, you have entered into pride and nothing works. Humble yourself un under the mighty hand of God. Rejoice when there's no reason to rejoice and watch the grace of God be found to deal with you in the area you need to be dealing with. Every issue right now in our lives is going to be an issue of pride versus humility, belief versus unbelief. That's where it is right now. And to rejoice in the Lord is a person that says, I do this out of honor to God, I humble myself, I will rejoice in the Lord. The fig trees are not blossoming. I don't have any fruit on the vines. It's nothing working. I got no, I got no, 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 no cattle. Nothing's happening. Yet, I will rejoice. That's a humble man that says, there, in the natural, there's no reason for me to rejoice, but I will rejoice. I will humble myself before God. I will enter into that place of rest and watch God show up and restore unto me everything that was stolen. Thank you, Lord. you see how all this is going together now? Look at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30 and 31. These are the things we do, ladies and gentlemen. These are the things we do. This is our faith taking possession of things. And how do we do it? We, we do these things to, to stay in that place of rest. Uh, just because I finished with the series, you're going to see now how it's applicable in everything we do. That place of rest, that's never going to change. You're going to have to stay in that place of rest. That's where the attack of the enemy comes in, trying to get you to get out of rest so that you won't see manifestations. Look what he says here. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. Okay, the man hungry, he came in the back, got some food off, out of my basket. Okay, all right, I'm not going to despise you, but look at the next verse. But, uh-oh, <laughs> if he be found, if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Now, how many of you know the Bible says in the New Testament that Satan is the thief? And the thief cometh but to do what? To kill, to steal, and to destroy, okay? So this would apply to him. If you catch the thief, well, we already know he's the thief. Amen? Amen? Say out loud, Satan, I know who you are. 
And the Bible says if you, kept, if you, if you catch him, if he be found, you can make him, he shall restore you sevenfold. Amen. So I declare right now with your life that everything the devil has ever done in your life, I command him by the authority of Jesus, sevenfold, sevenfold, sevenfold. Sevenfold restoration's coming. Sevenfold restoration's coming. Sevenfold restoration's coming. But you got to believe that. You got to believe it. Just because I read that in the Scripture, that don't mean a heal of beans. You got to believe that. Well, I don't believe it's going to be sevenfold. Well, don't worry about it. It won't be. <laughs> you got to believe I believe that. I, that is a part of my confessions when I pray. Part of my confession is everything that the devil stole, everything that was taken from me, every rumor that was circulated about me, everything that ever took place, I thank God for a sevenfold restoration. Amen. I will not let go of that. I'm not going to let go of that. Sevenfold, sevenfold restoration. I have found the thief. It was the devil, you ugly devil. You found the thief. Sevenfold restoration. Amen. But, but how involved are you with believing this? Involved enough to put it in your mouth. Involved enough to rejoice over it, you know. I'm rejoicing for the sevenfold restoration that is to come. Now, while you sitting there, you know, you're looking at somebody who's saying that. Keep looking and watch what happens in their life. God will restore it down to the exactness sevenfold. Down to the exactness. Somebody stole money from you, he can restore it sevenfold. You know, I love those Christians say, well, why stop at seven? Let's just believe him for a thousandfold. You need to get, you know, it's like steps. <laughs> Step, leave a thousand alone, get to seven. Take the seven. Use the scripture, take the seven. <laughs> All right? I'm going to believe for a thousand. You can't believe one for one fold right now. Just shut up, quit being deep. Believe God for the seven. Somebody say sevenfold. Seven and that's what you can expect. So now you got to take some time, get it home, and, and look what's been stolen. What has been taken? What has been lost? What needs to be restored? I'm sure he was behind it somewhere. Yes. So you, you might as well believe for sevenfold. I thank God for sevenfold. In fact, I'm going to just do it for you right now. Lord, I thank God for a sevenfold restoration of this congregation. Sevenfold restoration of the people in this congregation. Satan, we know who you are. And we command a sevenfold restoration in Jesus' name. You believe that tonight? You receive that tonight? Yes. Amen. Well, go ahead and start rejoicing over that tonight. Go ahead and start rejoicing over that tonight. You see, you see what I'm saying? You don't wait until you see the sevenfold to rejoice. Your rejoicing is going to move you to that place of rest where you can see the manifestation of the sevenfold. There's something to be said about a happy church. And there's something to be said about old, deep, boring church. Bunch of stiff sitting up in the doggone chair, just, yas. You got to shout. Your shouting is explosive. Your rejoicing is explosive. Your praise is explosive. Your worship is explosive. That'll fool hell. Hell can't figure out why you shouting. You start shouting, they start checking with folks. Something happened, y'all gave them something. What, what, what's going on? You need to let the devil know what you have taken from me doesn't stop me. For yet will I rejoice. Now, you don't have all those things that Habakkuk have, but you got a cabinet. No food in the cabinet. No money in the wallet. Huh? Big tax bill just came in. Seven miles to feed. Don't know how you're going to get another job. Yet! Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm trying to get you out of your apathy. I'm trying to let you know there's something about a shouting Christian that'll get results in the middle of his praise that won't happen any other way. Sometimes you just got to let all hell know that I know what you did to me. Yeah. will rejoice.
some of y'all need a good shout anyway. I can tell. I don't know what happened to some of y'all today, but y'all, you just need to go and just, just a, I just got to praise the Lord. I got to praise the Lord. I don't even know what happened today, but I'm, I'm going to go and praise the Lord. Yet I will rejoice. That's how you get it to happen. That's how you get it to happen. I believe that. I believe something supernatural is released in a praise. No, 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 no. It's not, it's not as some people thought, well, those are emotional religious people. Uh-uh, baby. When you ain't got nothing to shout about, that's when you need to shout. Amen. Isaiah 61 and 7. I mean, I, I'm glad you're doing it here, but you, this, you, you need to do it where it matters. When ain't nobody around and when you ain't at church and can't nobody see you. You understand what I'm saying? I have been at home by myself, gotten crazy news and just said, Halamo Shekakalaba, just real quick. Don't take no much. God just want to know where you're at. Now, this ain't messing with me. I'm going to praise you, Lord. And you get to preaching to yourself. You get yourself happy. I'm going to pray. You done forgot you had a problem. Yet. I'm going to leave that thing alone, y'all ain't. Y'all ain't ready. Isaiah 61, 7. He says, for your shame. There I go again. For your shame, you shall have double. God is absolutely convinced for anybody that has shame on them, he wants to recompense. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you Sunday, everybody had got some kind of shame on them. But the God of recompense wants to give you double for shame. He says, for any confusion, he said, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting, there it is again, joy shall be unto them. Please listen to me. Christian people should be displaying joy. We got, we got to figure that out. If we're, we're, somebody says, well, I understand the grace message. That means you ought to have double joy. We haven't figured that out. We need to be happy. We can't, Christianity is not about going around with this suffering thing. Somebody to say to you, you know, we're going to kill you. Actually, a Christian's response should be, you know, let's do it, boy. I finally get to see Jesus. They ought not be able to figure you out. But we've taken on the characteristic of a sad world, and we don't show them the joy of our life as Christians. So they have no reason to want to be like us because they don't see nothing different. And they ought to see something different with us that when we don't have all of what they have, we still happy. We still full of joy. We still know how to have a good time. That's important. I know it don't sound deep, but that's so important. Nobody wants to be like the Christian that's not happy. It's just everything's always so serious with him. How you doing today? I'm blessed. For real, though? <laughs> just be happy. Be who you are. Be who God made you. Enjoy life. It's time to enjoy life. I'm glad I got to this point right here. It's, it's, it's not time for you to sit around waiting to see who's going to come and make you happy. 
Dude, you need to step on out that door and be happy. <laughs> step on out that door. Go to the gas station, get you some nine ladies, man. You need to be happy. You need to figure out how to be happy. It's like a tragedy for a Christian who's filled with the Holy Spirit, who has Jesus and the gospel of grace, and you're sad? Amen. No, man. You got to figure that out, boy. Got to figure out how to be happy, man. Get you some Cheerios tonight and put some bananas in it. <laughs> be happy. God's been too good for us to allow other people's drama to steal our joy. Well, I want everybody to like me. Everybody ain't gonna like you. Let's just get real with it. Everybody ain't gonna like you. But be grateful for the few that do. Amen. Well, what do you do, Pastor Don, when nobody don't like you? That's because you don't like yourself. Because the only way you can be in that kind of position, you must be giving off something. You don't like you. You got to like you. And it becomes attractive when you're confident about who you are and you like yourself. That starts drawing people, man. Folk can't stay away from you, boy. It's like flies finding some candy somewhere. They just got to get down there, man. But not if you all the time, you know, nobody likes me. I don't know why. I just get hurt all the time. Folks are always taking advantage of me. Stop. Stop. This gospel is greater than that. Amen. Well, Brother Doll, I want more scripture. No, let me talk to you about getting a life. <laughs> well, I want to be married, but ain't nobody came yet. I done told y'all. Meet black people, meet black.com, <laughs> something like <laughs> I forgot the name of it, you know. What <laughs> My daughters asked me the other day, they're like, all right, so if you weren't married to mama and you were single now, what would you do? Shoot, meetblackpeople.com, christianmeet.com, farmersmeet.com. I'd be all on them dot coms. I'd be, until I meet somebody. I won't never go by myself, though. The meeting gonna be with no trust. What's your name is now? You got to figure out how to, how to live. You got to do something. Go. You, got to, you got to figure it out. You got to figure life out. I, I don't have a specific answer because I don't know your specific situation, but I know you have a Jesus. I know you got the Word. I, I know you got the Holy Ghost. He can lead and guide you. And I know that there's somebody in this church like you that would enjoy your company. If you can just kind of get out of your little corner somewhere and, and just not be afraid to be who you are. And they just, and people like authentic folk. They don't like folk trying to be like everybody else. Just be you. I can't be me because they might not like me. I don't like y'all already. <laughs> Amen? Look at Acts chapter 3. So important to be happy. Walk out of here being happy. No, man, this ought to be the happiest place in Georgia. I'm going to the Happy Dome. We need to just name it the Happy Dome. These folk, folks need to accuse us of being drunk. When they walk in here in our church, they ought to say, them people, them the happiest people I've ever seen before in my life. Well, hey, brother, how are you? Bless God. And you look at them like, ooh. And they think everything is perfect in your life. And you tell them, no, everything's not perfect, but I'm not going to make it better by being sad. So I decided not to allow it to affect me. I decided not to allow my circumstances and situations to affect me. I'm going to impact that, my circumstances and situations. I'm going to rejoice. But you, you ain't got no job? No, not right now, but I'm going to rejoice. It's on the way. Well, where you stay at? They put me out last week. Glory to God. So you ain't got nowhere to stay either? Well, praise God. He make a way for me every day. How you happy like that? And you ain't got no job. You ain't got nowhere to stay. Because I know Jesus. He loves me, 
and this ain't, this is just temporary. I'm, I'm going to be all right. He, he might be trying to use me somewhere. I've just been menacing to everybody I go to, but it'll be all right. I, I'll be in a mansion for you know it. They need to meet that kind of a Christian that's always hopeful. <laughs> Some of y'all look at my, yeah. You got to decide whether you're going to believe. Believing's up to you. Ain't nothing I can never do to make you believe. Neither can Jesus. Believing's up to you. I just believe everything he says. I'm going to be happy. You know, that's one reason why people die early. It's not really because of it. It's health, but it's health. It's disease that comes as a result of dis-ease. Yes. When there is dis-easement in your life, that becomes the platform for disease in your physical life. Cortisol that's released throughout your body does more damage than you can ever imagine. And all of that comes because of stressful lives that are carrying care and just don't know how to chill. You know, you're doing things you don't want to do because you feel pressure. And you ought not do that. I mean, you need to learn how to say no, some of you. I'm talking to somebody right now. I have completely left the script. Somebody come ask you stuff, you, you're a yes person, yes every time. And some of the stuff you just hate doing is just no. Is, you need to practice no. 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 You all burdened down over somebody else's stuff, doing something God didn't even want you to do. You're trying to help people that God won't even help. Look at that. What? That's some people God won't help. That's some people God won't even help. Not because they don't want to. They won't let him. It's a sad thing for you to be sad because of somebody else's drama. Wow. It's painful. Hurts. You need to get rid of that and be happy. And look young as long as you can. Wrong kind of people will age you real quick. They be having you shaking, you know. Somebody mention their name, you. <laughs> now, I'm sure some of you are like, you know, you're in the flesh right now. Whatever. Man, why your face shaking like that? What do you mean? What, like what? You don't even know what's going on. It's all involuntary. Yeah, ain't nothing wrong with me. Them folks that got on your nerves, you should be. You being with somebody trying to find your bottle. <laughs> My wife was so funny one time. She had been dealing with just a lot of drama, counseling and stuff. One day we left work. She'd get home by 8 o'clock. I said, Baby, how was your day? She said, I need a drink. <laughs> she said, ooh, your cousins, boy. <laughs> now, I'm doing something here. I want you to just kind of check some things out a little bit. It's like, I want to check, I want you to check yourself out. I'm, I stepped out of the realm of giving scriptures. I'm not reading the Bible. I'm not making any spiritual statements. I'm just talking to you right where you are. And some of you having a problem, like, I don't want you talking to me like that. If I don't, if I, if I don't want to be happy, I ain't got to be happy. Sometimes it's just not that deep. Amen. Why get saved and you still gonna be the same? Hmm. Same struggle, same unhappy, same all everything. The gospel is bigger than that old crap that's trying to destroy you. Shame is not Sunday. It's like a weight that wants to keep you from reaching your assignment for life. P. 
people who are guilty say, I need to confess this to get it off my chest. Mm. People who are shameful say, I need to hide this so nobody can see it. Mm. Mm. Whenever you find yourself so ruled by somebody else, you're fighting shame. It, it produces a level of paranoia well, you think people are thinking things about you that they ain't even thought about. Amen. And it's designed to waste you away, to rob from you the abundant life. And if you don't deal with it, it'll act like hurt. Hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. People who are shameful try to shame people. Mm -hmm. And it becomes an enemy that'll rule your whole life and you won't even know what it is. You'll sit and try to figure out what's wrong with me and it's called shame. Shame always wants to hide you, yourself or hide. That's what happened with Adam and Eve when they sinned against God and, and they did what they did and God came looking for them. They hid themselves. The Bible says they were afraid, but it was really shame. And once shame comes in, it becomes the foundation for fear it becomes a foundation for hurt. It becomes a foundation for guilt and condemnation. And God is committed to restoring us double for shame. Thank you, Lord. And the only reason you can't feel free to be happy and be like yourself is because of shame. And you have to carry the facade to make people think higher of you so they can't really see who you really are. Men afraid to become transparent because of shame. I don't want nobody to see who I really am. Don't even want your wife to see who you really are. And it's time for us as Christians to learn how to be happy. Yes, sir. And to rejoice for no reason except Jesus. Yes, sir. I'm happy why Jesus. I got Jesus and that's enough. Amen. Verse 19 in Acts 3 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted <clears throat> that your sins may be blotted out. <clears throat> when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. There's a refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. You don't believe me, try it. Go home and spend 30 minutes in the Word another 15, 20 minutes praying in tongues, listening to your favorite gospel music or whatever it is, and I guarantee you there's a refreshing that comes in that space. There's a refreshing that comes in that space. And that I believe we, we, you know, somebody says, well, you need to go to church or you need to get in the Word. I want to go from needing to to wanting to. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And when you get to the place of wanting to do it because you, you look forward to that refreshing, that time of refreshing, that's when it begins to matter, man. I can't, I can't wait to get, get home so I can spend time with God and close my door and get in the Word and pray in the Spirit. There's a time of refreshing that's coming. Now, those are individual times, but prophetically speaking, God is, God is about to release a time of refreshing over the church. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 20. And he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you, verse 21 whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Now, here's this word restitution. I want you to look at these definitions. It means a reparation made by giving an equivalent or compensation for the loss. So the equivalent of, of whatever was lost, damaged, or injured. Is coming to you, an equivalent of it. That's a restitution. He also says it's the restoration of property or rights previously taken away, conveyed, or surrendered. But here's the one I like. Restoration to the former or original state or position. In other words, the promise is 
that he must be received until the time of restitution of all things. God has not forgotten what has been stolen, what has been taken, what has been lost, what has been damaged. He has not forgotten. For him to forget means that he would be in debt to us, and God is not going to be in debt to any man. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to walk into a season of restitution. Not by my hands, not by your hands, but by the hand of the Lord. And guess where you have to be to see it manifested? The place of rest. In that place of rest. And I'm just saying, you, 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 you're, not op, you're not created to operate out of stress. You're not created to operate out of worry. You're not created to operate out of caring cares. So start practicing abiding in that place of rest because restoration is at hand. The most useful weapon of the devil is shame. And that's all he wants to do. Find a way to shame you. Person that maybe used to go to this church, something happened, somebody find out about it. Out of all the thousand people that are here, shame stops them from coming to finish whatever they need to do. I don't think people understand, I'm, I'm, and I've tried to prayerfully think about ways to say what I know and what I see where this life is concerned. I just sometimes don't think people can really handle it, but God is not nearly as concerned about the things you're concerned about. Please understand what I'm saying. He is concerned about you. And he will perfect those things that concern you. But when you miss the mark and when you mess up, you think that's the end of life. And God is like, look, please get up. I just need you to understand how powerful it is for you to finish. I need you to finish. You're stuck on this. I need you to finish. This is nothing compared to the impact that you'll have if you finish. Yes. Amen. So shame is designed to stop you from finishing. God needs you to finish. He needs you to be like Paul. Out of all the hell that Paul went through, here's the powerful statement about his life. I finished my course. I kept the faith. I finished my course. I know this to be true. I can't tell you the number of times where I've thought, let's just quit. Why not? Let's quit. If they don't believe this, then just whatever. Just stop. It's like, who cares if they don't believe? Just go away. Why do you need to get beat up on all this stuff? That's not it. The beat up is not it. Finish. You never know what's going to happen between the, the place of shame and you finished your course. That's the champion. Nobody remembers how you start. Everybody remembers how you finish, so finish well. Finish well. But we get hung up on all the wrong stuff. You get hung up on the mistake you made 10 years ago. You get hung up on, you know, what you didn't do here. You get hung up on how that didn't happen. And, and all those things are great because we're developing in our character and Jesus is developing us and all of that stuff. But don't get hung up there. Go forward. When Jesus was in the garden and all of hell came on him, Pressed until he began to sweat blood out of his pores. If you'll read the scripture carefully, the one recommendation was go forward. <clears throat> go forward. Figure out how to go forward. Because restoration is what awaits you. You just can't see it from where you are right now. It's all going to turn out well. Amen. 
don't quit. And y'all know we live in a generation where people just quit. And it is the devil's job to throw everything at you to get you to quit. I know what it feels like to be at that place of suicide. I know what it feels like to be at that place of, of stress and frustration. Don't quit. I'm so glad I didn't pull the trigger. I'm so glad you didn't pull the trigger. Because it gets better. The story changes. Don't get hung up on it. You're human. You missed it. But Jesus has made a commitment to you that he will continue to develop you all the way up until the return of the Lord. He's committed to your development. I just need to get you to be as committed to your development as he is. Don't stop. Don't stop. I ain't going to stop. I ain't quitting. I cannot get this thing out of my head. When the Lord showed me, I saw it in a vision. Me walking before the throne of God and hearing my good and faithless servant, job incomplete. Seriously? You didn't finish. 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 You have everything you need. Maybe it's just one life that's going to be impacted, but that one life's going to impact millions. Finish. Finish. I don't know why I'm going this way tonight. Maybe somebody came here in a real hopeless situation, whatever it may be. You need to hear this. God is faithful. Yeah, I'll say that. You brought that to my memory. God is faithful. Hmm. And he doesn't need your faithfulness for him to be faithful. So he is faithful, and you are the beneficiaries of his faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. Yes. That's powerful. That means God is always going to be faithful. And if you can believe it, you can benefit from him always being faithful. But you know the only thing that will stop you from being a recipient and a beneficiary of his faithfulness? Shame the type of shame that'll cause you to quit. The type of shame that'll cause you to go back in the club and dance on the pole. The type of shame that'll cause you to go back out and selling drugs again. Since I'm already shameful, I might as well just go somewhere else and do it when nobody won't make me feel bad. No. Restoration, restoration and restitution is at hand. Don't quit now. It's the wrong time to quit. You're about to bump into everything you ever dreamed about. Look at Job 42 and 10. Job 42 and 10. In Job, had the situation where he just wouldn't forgive the guys who betrayed him in a sense and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. When did he turn the captivity of Job? When he prayed and forgave his friends. And then the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. I said, Lord, why was that so important? He said, because he was in pride. He wouldn't do what, I, what needed to be done and as long as he was in pride, I couldn't flow my blessing through him. And as soon as he humbled himself and prayed for his friends, I was able to give him twice as much as he had before. Don't let pride stop restoration. Don't let it stop your restoration. Pride is submitting to yourself, your performance, and your way of doing it. Humility is submitting to God and being God-reliant and trusting in what he wants to do. And if God said to cast your care on him, and you decide to hold your care, you're in pride when you hold your care. When you cast it on him, like he said, you've humbled yourself. You will find the anointing and restoration in humility, not in pride. Go to Jeremiah 33, 9 through 11. Jeremiah 33, 9 through 11. A couple more scriptures and then we'll, well, actually one more, two more.
my time's up, but Tap is out of town and I ain't got nothing to do, so I'm gonna put, <laughs> I'm gonna put five more minutes on the clock. <laughs> seriously, seriously, five more minutes on the clock. <laughs> he, 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 nothing, five minutes. <laughs> Verse nine, and it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all of, of, the, of the prosperity that I will procure unto it. 10. Thus saith the Lord, again there shall be heard in this place which ye say shall be desolate without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitants and without beasts. Verse 11. The voice of joy, look at there. The voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall, be, that shall bring the sacrifice of praise, for them that will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord, for them who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. What God is saying is, if you'll come to church and do something you don't feel like doing, he says, I'm going to take the captivity of your life and I'm going to turn it around just like it was before somebody messed with it. Amen. Amen. We got to figure out how to come to church. We come to church with praise on our lips. Sacrifice means I don't feel like doing this. Right. I am tired. My feet hurt. Somebody done got on my nerve. Yet, I'm going to give the voice of praise because something happened to me last week I need turned around. But notice the prerequisite. I need a voice of praise. I need somebody to, to bring the praise to the house of the Lord. Wow. A sacrifice. You see how important this is? Joy and praise in the house of God. Our praise service shouldn't be boring. You shouldn't be sitting back waiting on somebody to entertain you. You ought to be jacking them up. Come on with it. Come on. What? What? <laughs> if you're going to sing it, sing. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 6 through 12. I will cause to return the captivity as at the first. I'll bring it back like it was before they messed it up. And then you add seven times that, that's sevenfold if you catch the thief. So God says, I'll cause it to return like it was. If you catch the thief, I'll get it back to you sevenfold. Look at verse 6. And I, this is a story in verse 6 where Nehemiah was just freaking out because they were charging them interest. They had made enough money to buy their, their kinfolks back out of slavery, and they were just taking advantage of them. So look at what he did. He says, I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. And look at verse 7. Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and I said unto them, You exact usury or interest every one of his brothers. And I set a great assembly against them. Verse 8. And I said unto them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold unto heathens. And will ye even sell your brethren, or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. So they couldn't reply. Verse 9, also I said, it is not good that you do. Ought you not to walk in the fear of God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? 10, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you let us leave off this interest or usury. Now look what he said. He said this, restore, I pray you to them, even this day. Restore their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their houses, 
also the hundred part of the money and of the corn and the wine and the oil that you exact of them. Verse 12. Then said they, we will restore them and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and took an oath of them and they should do according to this promise. Now here's what I got out of this story here. Nehemiah said, restore. And there are Christians today who won't even say that. And I am saying, put this in your vocabulary. Stick it in the very forefront of your mind. And when you see things that are going the wrong way, shout, restore. If, you see, that's who we are as Christians. We, let me show you why I say, say this. Look at Psalms 107 and, and 2, and I'll stop here. Psalms 107 and 2. So the next time I ask to put five minutes on the clock, put five minutes on the clock. I don't say that just to be saying that. I mean, I want to see five minutes on the clock because I ask you to put five minutes on the clock. So don't just leave it at zero when I ask you to put five minutes on the clock unless you already put five minutes on the clock and I didn't recognize that five minutes have gone down to zero. <laughs> I'm just saying. That was a quick five minutes. All right, look at this one, last one. Let the redeemed of the Lord. Now, let me ask you a question. What's the redeemed? Isn't it somebody who's been delivered out of something and restored? The redeemed are the restored, aren't they? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hands of the enemy. What he, did you see what he just said? He said, you who are restored, say restore. If you've been, if you, you who have been restored, say restore. I've been redeemed. I've been delivered. I've been restored. Say it, restore. We don't sit there and get beat up by the devil. We're redeemed. We're restored. If anybody believes in restoration, it should be the redeemed. Amen. 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 Praise God. Lift your hands up and give God thanks. I'm done with you for tonight. Mm. Lord, restore. Lord, restore. Lord, Biriando de Honga Gisnengi Lugumba, Vilin Dande de Bande de Bruce de Riaca. Lord, prove this to your people. Let signs follow this teaching tonight. Let signs follow it, Lord. At the place of rest, let this church find restoration, peace, and ease. Thank you, Jesus. Even right now, Lord, there is rest for their souls right now. Rest for their souls. Lord, I give you praise for that. And the very thing that would have stressed them out, Lord, that is that place. Cause restoration in that place. Cause restoration in that place right now. Lord, we say restore. We say that. It comes out of our mouth. It is our declaration. Everything that was lost, everything that was stolen, everything that's missing, restore. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we celebrate Jesus right quick? Celebrate Jesus right quick. Oh, la la basa, la la bas.
And I want you to know, if you believe this, you'll never be ashamed. I'm going to show you Sunday. Jesus gave the answer of how to totally defeat shame. You know how? With a promise. With a promise. Remember that woman who showed up to dry his feet, washed his feet with her tears? And there was a Pharisee in there and said, that woman's a sinner. Somebody say shame. shame. Yeah. And as soon as he shamed her, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. You know what Jesus was saying? Here's what you use against shame every time. A promise. A promise. And the issue is no longer shame. Now the issue is, will you believe it? Will you believe what Jesus promised? God has not forgotten you. He loves you. And all of your shame is going to be washed away. Amen. And you will be set free to finish your course. And nothing will by in any means hurt you. Turning three people and tell them, all is well with me in my house. Come on, for about 20 seconds, can we just praise God? Can we just shout under? Can we just shout under God with a voice of triumph? Oh, praise you, Lord. Glory, 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 glory. Lord, we praise you, Jesus. We praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. All right. Father, what do you want us to give tonight? Help us even in our giving. Speak to our hearts on what you want us to sow. We do it out of obedience and love and joy and thanksgiving. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need an offering envelope, if you'll raise your hands up, the ushers will go ahead and, and uh, get it to you. We're going to get you out of here. You've been so awesome tonight to let me just minister to you. <laughs> if you're giving by text, the information is on the screen. God loves you guys. You, just, you, need, you need to know that. He is not angry at you. He's not... He loves you, all right? He's not setting up the big punishment to come one day. He loves you. And he will restore. Just believe it. God, God's will is for me to be restored. Amen. Well, but brother, what if you had a husband and he just beat the snot out of you and God will restore. He going to restore him? Well, well, you know, not him with you necessarily, but he'll, he'll restore. He could restore him. He, he, you know, God, God is God. Is there anything too hard for God? No. No, it's not. Praise God. All right, ready? Hold your offerings up. Father, we present this to you as our trust. We prove to ourselves once again that we trust you. And because we trust you, God, hallelujah. We know that we can trust you with the bigger things in our lives. Father, we sow this seed in faith, and we thank you, Lord, that it will minister into the lives of people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's just go ahead and receive this offering tonight. And if you're here and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you want to make him the Lord of your life, if, you, if you're here and you've never... You've never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. 
you're here tonight and you believe God wants you to join this church or wherever you may be tonight in one of our churches, we'd be glad to have you. We love you. We just want you free. I want you to get a life and enjoy the life that Jesus has given to you to enjoy. You get, you get this shot right here. Don't blow it. Live well. Be happy and expect restoration at that place of rest and enjoy Jesus. Amen? Enjoy Jesus. And so what I'd like to do is, if congregation can help me tonight, if you'll stand and, and just minister to the people who are around you, ask them if they're born again, if they like to be, if, if they want the baptism of the Holy Spirit or join the church, if they say yes to any of those things, bring them on down and we'll minister to them and pray with them. And, Don't you appreciate those who've come down here and those who've come in, in your local areas? We so appreciate you. Father, we shout grace, grace over their lives and situations. We command that those mountains be reduced to plateaus. They'll never be the same again because of your awesome grace and love and mercy. And so, Father, we thank you that you will minister those things to them tonight. And we thank you for their lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. At this time, if you'll turn this way and follow um, our deacons to the prayer room, they're going to minister to you. Um, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And everybody said amen. Good night, everybody. Amen.